Hello and um, welcome back if you're an EVA person and hello to those who are joining us anew. Um, just to say that this talk is being run in conjunction with um, EVA, um, the conference which is running at the moment, um, notionally EVA London, but of course we have speakers from all over the world with us at the moment and located all over the world, um, plus the Art AI Festival. And I'll hand you over to um, Tracy in a second actually to talk a bit more about that. Um, EVA is an annual conference and traditionally the Computer Arts Society looks after the first night. Um, we thought there was an interesting opportunity this time to coincide with the Art AI Festival uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because the Art AI, Art AI Festival is running at the moment, it's running for a period of time, but it's also a topic which is of great interest to members of the Computer Arts Society and EVA. So I think it'd be very interesting to have a, a panel session with experts talking about AI. Now, we had a little bit of AI during the afternoon session at EVA, um, and I'm sure that there might be the occasional reference to that, but this is a standalone event. It um, doesn't require you to have to have been to EVA or to come to EVA in future, and we are going to be recording it and sharing it online. Now, we're streaming on YouTube, although some people are here with us with Zoom. Um, any questions, we do ask you to put them on YouTube so the questions can be shared amongst everyone. Um, uh, there's often a slight delay between what we're seeing as the Zoom hosts and what's on YouTube. So if your question gets asked, you may have to wait um, you know, 10, 20 seconds before it gets seen. But um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. So I personally think it's going to be a really interesting hour, hour and a half. What I'd like to do is briefly hand you over to Nick Lambert, who's the chair of the Computer Art Society, who will say a few words before we then hand over to Tracy. Okay, Sean, thank you very much. So, uh, yes, it's very good to be here this evening. Very to be part of uh, EVA London for, uh, you know, the uh, is in, well into the second decade now of Kaz's involvement with EVA. So I'm pleased that uh, everything is uh, sort of ticking over. And of course, our, our presence online has uh, offset the issues with, uh, with COVID into, into this uh, second uh, online EVA conference that we've been running. So yeah, I'm very excited to uh, hear the discussion about AI and art. And so uh, very pleased to uh, see Tracy, obviously, and Melanie and uh, Luba and uh, all, all those who are discussing uh, AI and of course a shout out to Ernest as well so we're looking forward to that and Cecile and Marina and uh, Ava as well so uh, this, this, this should be a really good uh, meeting and um, continues I think as long-standing interest of the um, Computer Arts Society in uh, uh, artificial intelligence and something that we want to uh, explore in its uh, sort of fullest now that, uh, that there are so many different routes into AI and art and I think that's uh, one of the sort of key areas we want to uh, Examine. So without further ado, either back to you, Sean, or should we uh, hand over? Well, I think we'll hand over to Tracy, actually. So I'm going to mute, so I'm going to sit back and enjoy it like the rest of you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sean and Nick. Um, it's certainly um, fantastic to be collaborating with you, uh, uh, with Eva, uh, for, for the Art AI Festival to have um, reach that August height where we're able to collaborate is, is great. Um, so welcome to this evening's online panel discussion. I'm Tracy Harwood, I'm the festival director. Um, I'm gonna try and corral our um, speakers, our panelists this evening. Um, in the YouTube chat with you this evening uh, is the festival's curator, that's Luba Elliott, and uh, Chris Tyra, who's the digital program manager at Phoenix in Leicester. Um, so please do put your questions in the chat and we'll get to those as um, as the opportunity arises um, as we're um, uh, engaging in the in the discussion here. Uh, as um, uh, Nick and I think Sean said earlier, we will be recording this this evening. We're going to be recording both in Zoom and also in the YouTubes and we'll post whichever is the best quality at the end of it. Sometimes the quality is a little bit variable. Um, but as I said, do feel free, free to um, drop your questions into the chat and we'll we'll pose them as we can. You can find out more about the Art AI Festival on our website, um, which you can find the information for um, on the YouTube channel. Uh, and also our social media is, is also there. And I think probably Luba will be posting as we're discussing this evening as well. So you can follow us on the, on the social uh, channels as well. But... Let me now um, start the proceedings by introducing the panelists. Um, I'll go through their bios and then what's gonna happen is each of them are gonna spend a couple of minutes um, 
giving us a bit of a provocation on what they think is the future of creative AI. So let me start with um, Ernest Edmonds. Uh, and I'm sure many of you know Ernest. He is a, a pioneering, uh, um, pioneering computer artist uh, for whom combining creative arts practice with creative technologies has been his lifelong pursuit. Uh, in 2017, he won the Association for Computing Machinery Special Interest Group on Computer Graphics and Interactive Techniques Distinguished Artist Award for Lifetime Achievement in Digital Art. He's the only uh, UK artist to have been so recognised. The, the only other one is actually Harold Cohen. Um, Ernest is um, also uh, noted for having uh, been awarded a second uh, ACM Special Interest Group um, Computer Human Interaction Lifetime Achievement Award for practice in human computer interaction, demonstrating that he's a truly tra transdisciplinary artist. Um, He's shown his work internationally for over 50 years. He um, has recently exhibited in Venice, in Leicester, in London, in Denver, in Vancouver, in Beijing, in Shanghai, and in Rio. Um, and his work has been described by Francesca Franco in uh, Generative Systems Art, the work of Ernest Edmonds, uh, which was published by Routledge in 2017. Uh, so, uh, our next um, speaker is going to be Melanie Lenz. Uh, now, Melanie is a, a London-based freelance and institutional cu curator specialising in digital arts. In 2020, she curated Futurist Listening by Steve Parker at Rich Mix. She's held dual roles as curator of digital art and digital programmes learning manager at the V&A Museum, where she co-curated Chance and Control Art in the Age of Computers in 2018, and has convened Symposiums including Art Design and New Technologies for Health in 2015 and uh, Transformations Digital Prints from the V&A in 2012. Uh, she's published papers on early Argentine computer arts, women art and technology and collecting and conserving born digital art. Uh, she's a guest lecturer at the Royal College of Arts and has broadcast widely on creative arts and advanced technologies. She's a, a juror for the Ashurst Emerging Artist Prize uh, for New Media and the Lumen Prize for Art and Technology. She also judges the Still Image and Global South Awards for Lumen. And then we also have Cecily Wagner Falkenstrom, who's a Danish artist employing new media such as machine learning to create interactive artworks. Uh, Cecily's artworks have been exhibited at the VA uh, and Experimenta um, Biennial Art Sciences in France, among uh, numerous other venues. Her artwork, Artificial Intelligence Frank, was awarded the Lumen Prize's AI Award, its first AI Award, in fact, in 2017. And her practice-based research project at uh, Royal College of Art received the British Arts and Humanities Research Council's Techne Award. Cecily studied fine art at the University of Arts London and Royal College of Art in London. And then finally, our panelist, Eva Jaeger, um, Eva is an artist, uh, uh, an associate curator at Serpentine Galleries in London. Um, she's part of the Arts Technologies team and R&D platform. And she's also co-investigator of the Creative AI Lab, which is a collaboration between King's College uh, London and Serpentine. Eva is currently working on, on Future Art Ecosystems Volume 2, an annual strategic briefing uh, which was launched last year that provides concepts, references, language and arguments that can be integrated into operational agendas for the construction of 21st century cultural infrastructure. Uh, a forthcoming paper with Dr. Mercedes Buns on inquiring the back ends of machine learning artworks making meaning by calculation, which will be presented at Art Machines 2 and a forthcoming performance work with Studio Lagrange, um, in which she is a, a collaborator, which is going to be showcased at uh, the VNA uh, in due course. So I'm going to hand over now to Ernest, who's going to begin with a, a short provocation before we get on to each of our other panelists. So Ernest, hand over to you, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, we'll just. Okay, there we are. So this is what we're talking about, the future of creative AI. I've been talking about it for quite a long time, slightly different from my fellow 
panelists, I'm afraid my view is a an old one, if you like, or a long one, at least. Let's hope it's not old fashioned, it's old. Uh, in fact, so old that I kind of tried to answer this question 50 years ago. This was a paper a colleague of mine, Stroud Cornock, um, sadly a late colleague of mine, and I presented at the Computer Graphics Conference in 1970. Just read the title, The Creative Process Where the Artist is Amplified or Superseded by the Computer. So our answer to the future was really in this question, is, was it going to amplify or supersede the computer, this AI? And that's what I've been worried about most of the time since and I'm still concerned about. But maybe in this panel, we need to think about these two words, creative, what does that mean? And AI, what does that mean? Well, creative, first, first of all, it might be personal. Everyone is creative. I've just found a new place to go on holiday a week or two ago, for example. Or it can be historic. That's like as, as an artist or a scientist would expect in their creative work. Uh, and for most of what I'm concerned with, what I'm going to say in my provocation, I'm really concerned with the historic end of that, doing seriously creative things. Product or process. Uh, it, are we concerned in creativity with the creative product or the creative process? Well, as human beings, it's the process. It's being creative that is important to us. Um, the products themselves are not really creative. They're just the what comes off the end of a creative process. So historic and process. AI, well, if you read the popular press, you get a very funny idea of what AI is. They think it's machine learning, which is a bit of it, but that's only one bit of it. It's concerned with recognizing things as machine learning often is, uh, reasoning about things, explaining things, and so on and so forth. You can also ask the question of product or process of AI. And I think this is important for us to consider too, uh, because in the standard definitions of AI, it's really concerned with process. It's concerned with interaction. How does something interact? If you look, for example, at the, the old standard Turing test, it's how does the machine behave that leads us to consider whether it's intelligent or not. So creative AI. Well, let's see, that could mean AI that is creative. That's in terms of that paper from 1970, creative people being superseded. Well, my provocation in that is what's the point? Uh, it doesn't benefit me any much at all. And is it really creative or is it really imitating human creativity? It might generate a product which is new and innovative, but is that to be creative? Or it might mean creative uses of AI, people's creativity being amplified by AI. That could mean improving life, improving the quality of life, improving creative people's lives. It could mean better art. So that is interesting. But the real question that's in the title of this panel is what next? So what next in art terms from my point of view, I'm going to talk about? Well, as I've probably indicated already, amplified creativity, the creative person being even more creative through using AI, concerned with process, and implied by that very specifically interactive art. So the future probably is AI being used to improve interactive things rather than make static objects. Oops, and then I've lost my slide, but never mind. I've lost my last slide, but there we are. I'm going to put it up if you will, excuse me. Slippy fingers. Uh, there we are. My apologies, my fingers are too. So the point is this, to be more specific, that creative AI is going to be concerned in the future more and more with action, action by humans detected by AI systems, actions by AI systems detected by humans, and the responses of both by the interaction between the two. 
But I want to move on from the notion of interaction, which I think is too limited. And I use the word influence, so I'm gonna finish on this point. Creative AI will be much more in the future, I think, concerned with long-term change, long-term influence of one on another, of different people in different continents influencing one another on AI systems influencing human beings and human beings influencing those systems. And these will be the subjects, in my view, of art that is using creative eye in the future. Thank you, Tracy. Mm. That's really interesting. Let's move on straight away to Melanie, please. Okay, it's wonderful to be here and thanks for that fantastic um, kickstarting off those provocations, Ernest. Um, so I think we're going to see a greater use of AI in art and design. Um, whilst there will be a backlash, co-creation where AI enhances human creativity will become a standard way of working. So um, what I hope and my provocations is, this, is that this will go hand in hand with a more discerning and critical use of AI. So I'm just going to share my screen now for a few slides um, that I hope kind of illustrate this point. So for this one, um, or for this point I'm making, I'm borrowing a graphic, um, how to build anything ethically, uh, the confluence of protocol streams. Um, an image by Carrie No, taken from um, the 2020 paper, Indigenous Protocol and AI. So you can see from the different streams, um, we've got here uh, data collection, governance, coding language, software design, use, distribution, compensation method, and physical computing device, um, that these all feed into making AI ethical. Um, and this is what I think will be um, at the forefront of one of the issues that will be uh, readdressed in the future when thinking about creative uses of AI. Sorry, my students have... Oh, okay, so sorry. Um, so um, Stephanie Deakins, I think, is a great example um, of a transmedia artist whose work speaks to this way of thinking. Um, through her practice, she facilitates dialogues about race, gender, aging, and future histories. Um, her optimistic and empathetic perspective challenges our understanding of AI. Um, she contends and questions whether AI can tell better stories, whether it can increase our perception and awareness of each other, um, to foment social equity and local communities. Her work shown here on the right-hand side, not the only one, uses AI to tell the multi-generational memoir of an African-American family through the perspective of a custom deep learning AI. And I think um, we're gonna see more works like this addressing these issues in the future. Um, another example of her work, PAC encourages people of color to teach something to um, AI developing technologies, thus getting them to engage um, and become aware of data biases and the formless white coded versions of platforms like Siri and um, Alexa just as an example. My, my second prediction um, is that there will be new metrics to appraise creativity. So um, mimesis is an old aesthetic concept, but it's often levied as a um, criticism against AI art. However, whether AI uh, art has lasting aesthetic values will require work that is not purely mimetic, but goes beyond this. So an example might be the hand curation of data sets that we see here in um, Anna Riddler's work. Um, I suggest that the notion of creativity will be revisited um, in the future. And then thirdly and lastly, I'll raise the topic of sustainability. Um, I recently heard artist Tamiko Thiel um, explain why she used existing data sets to create her AI artwork at the photographer's gallery, um, Lend Me Your Face. Um, and she talked about why she used the existing um, data set where you can see all the images that she used of um, celebrity heads are facing a particular direction rather than generating a new data set. And that was due to the environmental impact. Um, so I think someone who's like, like sums this up really well in his arguments um, is Memo Atkins. 
um, who kind of states that the current method of storing digital works, including AI works on a blockchain is unsustainable um, due to the energy costs and the ecological damage of crypto art, specifically NFTs. So my three provocation, which reads more like a wish list, uh, but I'm going to be optimistic, is that the future of creative AI will be more ethical, more empathetic and more sustainable. So thank you. Great wish list. <laughs> uh, okay, um, Cecily, please. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you here online today. So um, I think that in the future, we will move away from uh, talking about the AI artists towards talking more about what I term centaur artists. And I guess most of you, you know, the mythological figure of the centaur, which is like half human and half horse. So what I mean by this term is that in the future, we will see actor networks being up, up being artists. So you will see humans and technologies working together to create artworks. To be a little more specific, I can tell, uh, give an example from my own practice. So obviously I'm an artist, I'm educated from uh, the art academies, but in my art studio, I have uh, three amazing employees, full-time employees who are data scientists and the software developers working with me to uh, create my machine learning based artworks. And what this collaboration enables is a process where in a way it will often start out with me being like, can we do this and this and this? And uh, of course, I want to also ask like, um, set up off, set off us off on this endeavor where we want to in a way ask questions that are bigger than we can find answers to. to. So I'll come up with some questions and my uh, developers, they'll be like, oh, that's impossible. But then they will start thinking, they'll be like, oh, maybe we can do this. And then I'll be like, okay, let's try to start coding. Then we start coding. And then we look at what we do and we'll do, be like, okay, let's go a little in this different direction. And suddenly, you know, we have the algorithm or the technology in itself pushing back, back at us because then there's a bug or maybe, maybe for example, the loss function is totally fucked. And from a scientific research perspective, you would go back and try to fix the loss function and make it perform better. But from an artistic perspective, something extremely nice might have occurred that would never have, you know, come up if it hadn't been this kind of like collaborative process between artists, human artists, human uh, software developers and technology or the code itself, uh, GitHub uh, repositories that are being transformed and coded on top of and further developed working together. So basically, I believe that we will move into a future where we will stop talking so much about the individual artists and looking more into these uh, actual networks of uh, human and technologies creating together. Uh, and I think this also leads me to another point, which I think is really important, that I think in the future, we will start thinking more about AI as an, uh, as a, not so much a tool that enables the artist to do something, but more as a medium, which is part of this creative process where we, in a way, can quite ask bigger questions about who are we as humans, what lives do we want to live to, uh, to live in the, in the future together with our machine learning or AI technologies. So there's this notion, I think right now there's a lot of focus on the technology in itself and I love technology and I think that's amazing and I love together with my developers to, to develop cutting edge technologies based upon state of the art scientific papers. But I think it's even more exciting that by utilizing these new machine learning algorithms and developing a, a custom made software based upon these new scientific papers, we can actually ask questions that point towards, you know, what is the future we humans being want to live in? How do we want to live together, together and what role do we want these uh, technologies to play in our lives? Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. And finally, Eva. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to the other speakers. I love the idea of this sort of centaur or chimera made of many actors. Um, so I'm going to just speak a little bit from a more institutional point of view um, and describe sort of what we're interested in at the Serpentine R&D platform <clears throat> and within the creative AI lab. Um, 
everyone else was very positive. So I feel like a bit of a downer, but I'm going to sort of bring up some of a couple issues that I think sort of need to be ad addressed infrastructurally. Um, so the aim of the Creative AI Lab was always to surface particular ways that artists make use of machine learning. And that was in order to create models for engagement with new technologies by also people who don't consider themselves artists. And at the lab, uh, Mercedes and I are especially interested in these questions that everyone has raised. Um, and that's based on you know, her work uh, with artificial intelligence and data, data ethics, especially within the health industry, and also my experience working um, with artists to produce work that involves artificial intelligence in one way or another, and also um, my work as an artist using various machine learning systems. Um, Luba Elliott, actually, curator, was uh, very involved in helping us start up our uh, database, the database from the Creative AI Lab. Um, but, but two things are really standing out to us now, especially as we're sort of finalizing a paper that <clears throat> is forthcoming. One of those things is the lacking infrastructure for artists who graduate from a traditional art education backgrounds to develop practices working with machine learning. There's just a huge learning curve if you don't have a background in programming or creative computation. And this leads to a number of things happening when artists make work with AI, including the fact that they um, employ black box sort of apps and programs. And there's a sort of fear of inserting themselves into more cutting edge technologies and, and digging in. Uh, Cecile, you mentioned like reading computer science papers. This is a crucial part of keeping up with, with the industry. And it also in, involves a huge um, jump into a new language essentially. Um, and then they also end up using um, uh, there's a sort of like fear of inserting in, into certain conversations, I guess. And this learning curve um, that I'm describing from artists, it's also experienced within traditional arts institutions um, who don't have the capabilities or expertise to produce and interpret shows that are primarily about um, or use these technologies and end up using very vague and inconsistent language to describe certain phenomena or systems um, that are actually absolutely essential to our everyday lives. And they have arguably massive implications for the future. And rather than simplifying those technologies, really we need to be working together to try and develop new language, new metaphors around, around those technologies. Um, and the second thing is that we're in the very early stages of understanding the aesthetics of AI and understanding how making and using uh, AI in art practice can actually affect culture. Um, I won't go too much into the sort of theoretical framing of our paper, but what we're really interested in is shifting the focus away from the sort of front end or final artwork, as Ernest mentioned, um, the idea of the product towards the process and what we have positioned as the back end. So that's things like labeling, uh, labeling data, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, this allows us to sidestep the metaphor of automation. So we sort of argue that this is where the encoding of meaning is happening or the calculation of meaning by these AI systems. And it's where artistic practices can have the biggest role to play. And we need to sort of shift our interest uh, in creative AI from the outcomes into this back end environment and consider that the work itself. Um, and what's great is that as part of the lab, you know, we're not necessarily always responsible for commissioning final works and exhibitions. That's part of, you know, another part of my job. So what I can spend my time doing is understanding the ways that artists are working in these collaborative teams, as you mentioned, uh, building their own systems, experimenting and failing. Um, and I, I think that's the future. <laughs> Um, I'll just leave it there, yeah. So the future is failure. <laughs> That's really interesting. Well, we're already getting some great questions through from the audience, so please keep them coming along. But 
Um, I'm going to try and start us off with, uh, with one of those and link it to something that we'd already sort of um, slated as a, as a kind of a, a discussion area. So a, a lot of you are here are talking about this idea of, of collaboration, but I wonder if, if what you're talking about is, is, a genuine, um, is a genuine kind of collaboration. So to what extent is working with AI a collaborative process? And um, you know, is, is it really more about the AI generating something that um, is, is surprising and that, that titillates you from an aesthetic point of view. And I'm gonna ask that question to our creatives here. So Ernest and, and Cecily and, and um, Melanie and, and Eva, please do um, drop in if you, if you want to. So shall I start the answer? Um, so, uh, well, it, it's a difficult question because it's partly a question of how we use the language. Um, <clears throat> but I think that the idea that all that AI would do would be help us have surprises is a rather trivializing it. Um, I mean, we've been doing that with random numbers, picking numbers out of hats, throwing things on the floor and stuff for years and years and years. I think it's much more interesting than just creating surprises that we can consider and wonder about. I think that collaboration is a useful word to use, in my view, even though it humanizes the AI in a sense, because I, I think that what as artists we do is we create some AI system that does stuff or generates stuff or interacts in particular ways, and we observe and respond to it. And that response is usually to change what we did. So the AI is changed and we go through this process. And this process can, can sensibly be thought of as a collaboration. And at the end of his life, Harold Cohen, if you remember, um, who generated works. So he, he made programs that made Harold Cohen paintings, you might say. But he said at the end of his life, he saw his computer system, very much an AI system, uh, as a partner. And it was a partner because it produced something and then he saw it and he said, oh, actually, uh, it's good. It's really helped me, but now I'm not going to go with that. I'm going to make it different. And so in that sense, it was a true collaboration. And that's how Harold saw it. And I think that's how many of us will. So I think it's a matter of how you use the language, but I think it's quite a reasonable way to use the language and quite helpful. Cecily. Uh, yeah, so uh, I agree, and uh, I think I think it's really important to to stop thinking so much about. There's a lot of like conversations around. Oh, AIs will be the artists of the future, and you know we don't need artists anymore because we can just have the AIs do creative stuff. And I think that's kind of a really limited perspective because then you anticipate that you have the AI suddenly emerging out of nowhere, and then you have the system that can create stuff. But when we think about kind of like the essence of the artistic practice, it's about going to places we haven't been before. It's about investigating new, new territory. And in that sense, you know, you don't have an AI system that's there to begin with. The creations of the machine learning algorithms are a crucial part of the creative process. So you have human beings, artists and software developers starting coding and then that code pushes back at the creative process and then box a cure that also pushes back at the creative process. So in that sense, you can say that it is kind of like an entangled process between human and technologies working together. But I don't believe, we, even though the machine learning algorithm is, can find patterns on its own on a way be self-learning, you will still have human beings that initially created the software code that was enabled of finding these patterns. So, so I think it's really important to, to think about it, not so much as this kind of like entity on its own that can be creative, because then in a way we just have a product that can do a specific style transfer or something. And start thinking more about that, that practice involving machine learning is more about having the, the process where the, the medium is the machine learning technology and where you use that technology to, to find new places that you didn't new exist both creatively and aesthetically and in way in ways of questioning what can technology do and what can humans do and 
and how will we live our lives with these technologies. Um, Melanie, um, Eva, do you want to respond or are you uh, happy to carry on? Um, I can just say two words because this is a question I often ask um, of various um, a or artists who work with AI and although I get very different answers depending on individual people's practices I would say the majority of people um, or artists or practitioners say that they tend to see it as a co-creator and they collaborate um, with AI in order to like maximize output and add value to our creativity so yeah that seems to be the consensus but I just think it's a very personal um, an individual, um, depending on the artist and how they use it. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay, so another question that kind of related to that, and to what extent do you separate the input into content and style? Um, and uh, does the decision making come from the, a knowledge of the art context or your technical expertise? I guess you kind of touched on that, but explain a little more. We're trying to get to the heart of your creative process here. Ernest, okay. um, content and style. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the content of art is, so I have difficulty with that bit of the question. Um, the, uh, style is something what one is always shaping and changing. Um, so, you know, that's a subject of the work in a way. But I think that the um, the second part of the question is more interesting to me, which is where does the decision making come from? Knowledge of the art or the technical expertise and so on. Well, it must be both, right? I mean, one of the problems we have in our area is uh, sometimes people are not steeped as much in the history of art as would be helpful. And the other problem we have is that we have people who are not steeped enough in the knowledge of AI and computing as would be helpful. So actually, it's tough being a creative person. It's tough being an artist. You have to know a lot and learn a lot. And you're always learning. A very uh, well-known artist now no longer with us said to me late in his life, when I talked with him about learning the craft of whatever it was he was using as his medium at the time, and he said, well, in a sense, I'm always an amateur because I'm always learning. I'm always pushing my knowledge forward about the creative uh, potential of the medium. So being deep in a knowledge of the art, the art history, the technology, what it means and how to use it. These are the crit critical things. And so the quick answer to that is a single word like both. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Cecily, what's your view on that? I suppose by content, I mean the subject of. Okay, which might be, sorry. So if mm. it's, I mean, the subject of a work of art it, um, is often um, color or tone or tone relationships. I mean, it might be music or whatever. So and it, the, the content is often to do with relationships and how those relationships generate or enable uh, experiences. Perhaps I might quote my favorite paper, painter, most artists' favorite painter, I think, that I've met, Suzanne, who said that the main job was creating sensations. Right? He didn't mean portraying the sensations that he saw. He meant putting paint on a canvas in a way that created sensations in the eyes of the viewer of the painting. So the content is about creating sensations or maybe uh, it, it, we might find it easier to say experience. So we facilitate and create human experience. That's what it's all about. And that's the content. Yeah, so to follow on from that, I agree. And I think for me, the, the what I'm mostly concerned with is to create interactive experiences that or affective experiences that can make a human being think more about who they are in relationship to these uh, next generation technologies. Um, and then coming back to kind of like what, is, what comes 
who who is like taking the the decisions at the end, and who who takes the decisions to begin with in terms of the artist versus the developers. And I think this is such an entangled process. And I think it's also important, at least in my practice, of course, I create different artworks, but it's not like, you know, we have the artistic process starting with this specific artwork and then it ends with that artwork. You know, you have you have created other artworks and suddenly in this process and idea immersed, and then you're like, oh, this can actually be used as a point of departure for this new artwork that we are creating. So, so and, and then because I work like every, every day, I work closely together with, with the, the software developers working with me in my studio. So in that sense, I, I feel that it's such an entangled process that, that it's like the artistic way of questioning and the more you can say data science based way of questioning, they, you know, they approach the subject matter from different angles, but I wouldn't miss one of them because that's what enables us in a way to go hopefully to, to the edge of the both fields and find new paths that, that we would never be able to find on our own. And I think that's extremely valuable. And then I think that's another thing here that's also like at the forefront, because this is a field where in a way we use cutting edge technologies, you know, every day new GitHub repositories come out with new ways of using machine learning in Ghana, in LP and all kinds of nice ways. And it's a field that's, you know, moving at a high pace. And still this field with all these like crazy new technologies coming out, it's also a field where I think it's really crucial to, to remember always to point toward these more deeper human existentialistic questions about who are we, how do we want to live our lives together and with the technologies. Because I think that's where kind of like we don't get too absorbed in what is the new machine learning flavor of today and actually think about how can this also have relevant on a, a more deep level tomorrow, one year from now, 20 years from now. And I think that's really important when you're an artist working with all kinds of new technologies and, and generally and especially machine learning that you always think about having like the more artistic uh, way of questioning at the forefront. And that's of course also something that when you work together with software developers, that's a creative practice where you together also need to, to start asking questions in a different way than you would normally do. So both the software developers, they need to start to ask more open in the question. And you also want a more open in the process when you work as uh, when you have an artistic practice involving machine learning. And from the other angle, as an artist, you also want to be more informed by things happening on a daily basis in, in the software codes bug occurring that where suddenly, you know, an obstacle occurred, but then a new path opening and you want to keep yourself open to, to what's happening on a like really deep down in the code base and also high up in the kind of like more philosophical way of questioning that emerged between the human beings, the software developer human beings and the data science human beings and the artists human beings looking at the algorithms and, and what the algorithms generate. Mm. Yeah, re really interesting. But what we, what I think you're implying is that what what AI is good at is the cognitive stuff, not but not the emotional stuff. Kind of links to one of the questions that um, Ben Bogart has asked in um, in the YouTube chat. He says um, AI could have the potential to evaluate millions of um, valuable creative works based on a number of metrics that humans cannot um, comprehend. And I'm thinking here if if what you're trying to do is engage people at an, at an emotional level, how can AI help you reach people through your creative process when that's, you know, that kind of implicit knowledge or the emotional uh, level is what you're trying to deliver? Has, has it got a role there? What do you think? Maybe I should come because I think Ben pointed that question. At you. At, at me. Yes. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, e evaluation is a very important part of a creative process. So th there's, there's something, if you if you look at uh, research on creativity and so on, there's usually something called the evaluation function. So there's, there's uh, all kinds of bits of activities that are known to take place during creative thinking and creative acts. One of them is the operation of an evaluation function, which is kind of like determining whether you want to proceed with it or not and whatever. Um, so it, certainly valuation is important, but uh, 
it's not clear to me that we've seen any very interesting examples of people using AI for the evaluation function part of this process today. It normally seems to be the human who provides that part of the function. And it seems right in many ways that it should be. There are two things really. One is the criteria that the evaluation function is looking at. What are the criteria? And then what are the metrics that are used in order to judge whether that criteria, any particular criteria has been met? It seems to me that we're in a human world, we're creating things for a human world. Art is a human activity for human beings. And so it seems clear that those criteria are likely to be criteria generated by humans, unless the audience of the art is to be robots, which is fair enough. I mean, if the audience is robots, then the robots have better generate the, the criteria. Uh, but if the audience is human beings, then it's probably human beings that need to generate those criteria. Difficult as that might be, and difficult as it might be to articulate what they are. Which brings me to the problematic bit of your question, Ben, which is this notion of uh, metrics that humans cannot comprehend. Um, it's interesting to know what those might be. Um, there are unknowable things in life. That's absolutely true. But a metric that we cannot comprehend is difficult to understand as something that will be of any value in a creative process. So I have difficulty with that part of the question and therefore I'm not really answering that part of the question uh, because I don't get it, basically. Maybe <laughs> someone else on the panel understands better than me. Does anybody else want to pick that up? Sure, I guess um, the way I interpret that is, or, or maybe to go back just a second. I mean, what I found so interesting um, Cecily, when you were talking, you describe collaboration between you and the developers, which I think is, is often the collaboration that people confuse with the AI itself and the way that your logic systems were coming together and challenging each other and that you were forming a kind of new logic system. I think that that's at least what I meant by co co-working or collaboration and not so much with these certain machine learning systems, which we, you know, the element of surprise as, you know, others have pointed out, we can code these systems, a, a lot of them to do exactly what we want them to. And we can figure out exactly why they've done those things. And so the element of surprise is like kind of farcical in some senses. Then there's other kinds of um, AI, like, you know, I'm working with, with a group that's doing that's working specifically on interspecies communication between um, re certain reinforcement learning systems and a common octopus. And there, like that logic system can be developed specifically for the octopus. This might be to challenge your point, Ernest, that it really is only about you know, the human. But I think in that way, at this end of the question, asking, you know, what, what are the certain logics that hu or metrics that humans cannot comprehend? Well, there's lots of things that we, we miss out on. You know, we, we think that in order for something to be intelligent, it has to speak, uh, it has to use language. And we, you know, have completely missed out on understanding all kinds of communication mechanisms from, you know, dolphins and trees and so on. And some of these um, machine learning or reinforcement learning or whatever systems could open our eyes to all these different ways of communication because they don't have the same bias for the human logic. And so sometimes things that we see as a mistake, you can actually, you know, they're just recognizing another kind of pattern. Mm. Tracy, could I just come back? Uh, interesting points. That uh, two things. One very quick one on Eva's point that uh, about um, intelligence 
that isn't human. Of course, of, absolutely, of course. Well, I wasn't really talking about intelligence. I was talking about values. And if if the art if the art is for humans, then it's human values that matter. If it's for an octopus, it's octopus. It's the values of the octopus that matters, and so on. If it's for a robot, then it's the values of the robot that matters. Uh, and so, actually, we don't disagree about that either. But um, to come back to the uh, Cecily's point about collaboration, which is very important, and I just want to make the point that it's a very deep question. There's a lot about it that's really interesting uh, that we don't we won't get into in this panel. But uh, some of you know we did a lot of research on this uh, practical research with artists in residence programs a long time ago. Uh, that's, it's in books and so on, but. It turns out that the way that the teams work, the way that people interact with one another in these teams with software developers, artists and whatnot, uh, differs quite a lot. And it makes a lot of difference to how, what the outcomes are, what the makeups of these teams are and what the relationships are and what processes that go through in terms of having shared language and so on and so forth. And so this is a big subject uh, that uh, Cecily raised there and I just wanted to stress it, that it's, that it's also an important subject. And, and uh, it's not just like people happen to, you know, do something together. It's much more complex than that and much more interesting than that. It's a, it's a huge question, I think. Um, and one that will continually evolve as, as the, um, the ways that AIs are, are evolving to, um, uh, you know, look at new types of, of, um, of data, such as emotion, for example. Uh, and um, also the interpretation of different physiological um, objects and what have you. Um, there's a question that's come up, which um, is actually for, for Melanie. Um, I think it's a really good question though, and I think it's probably one that you can probably all reflect on here, which is, does AI's dependence on big data make it impossible for it to be ethical? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for asking that, uh, posing that question. Um, I don't think it's an easy one to answer. And um, one of the reasons I used um, Stephanie's um, example uh, in my short presentation was because she um, doesn't use big data, but collects her own data and encourages people um, who would usually maybe be slightly disenfranchised or not familiar with um, creative technologies to create and generate new data so that they're not excluded. Um, but yes, it is a real problem, I think, um, that uh, dependence on big data does make um, ethical work problematic. But I'd be really interested to hear what the other panellists have to say on this point. Who wants to pick it up? So I can pick it up. So I totally agree that this is like a key point. And there is something about, you know, there's no kind of like objective place where you can look at the world and say, okay, this is like the ethical gaze on the world. And I think that's also what's important here to stress because there's, you know, what's ethical depends on the culture you look at the world through. And, and, and you know, that's also the thing that we look into when it comes to data set, because obviously we need big data sets, but those data sets are normally created in a specific culture, typically in a Western world uh, male dominated culture so so of course there's something about getting all kinds of different cultures into this pool of the data set but i still think that in a way it's it's impossible to get this kind of like perfect ethical data set so that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do it we should try to create the most the best data data set possible when we're working with machine learning and when we're working with data to create artworks but I think this also points toward how important it is to create artworks that in themselves investigate what does it mean to collect data, as you also point towards Melanie in the beginning. What, what does it mean to have machine learning algorithms create patterns based on specific data sets? Where, where can speculations in where would this take us 10, 20, 50 years from now with, with the, the technology that will be developed in, in, in this period of time and things like that? So, so I think it's really like, in a way, AI art and questions related to ethic is kind of like so entangled. And I think that's some, something that basically every artist working with, uh, with machine learning, it, it will be questions that, 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 that will in a, be a, in a way be key to their artistic practice because it's, 
you know, you don't have machine learning without data and you don't have data without thoughts about how did I gather this data set. So, so basically this is like a, a, a core thing in an artistic practice with uh, machine learning and data. Maybe I could jump in to emphasize I agree entirely with that, but just sort of stress one particular point, which is that the ethics of big data sets is an enormous problem in the world. Yeah. which kind of means it's a very, very engaging and interesting issue for artists to grapple with. So to put it another way, what we just heard was that perhaps uh, one of the great things that artists can do is grapple with the question of the ethics of big data sets and make mm -hmm. art about that. Exactly. It's a great provocation, Ernest. Eva, um, do you want to jump in on this one as well? Sure. Um, I, I had an interview with an artist, Adam Harvey, recently, where I thought he just made such a sort of simple point that artists have, you know, for so long been involved in creating what we see in framing what we see, you know, painting what we see, photographing, etching, uh, telling stories about what we see. And now the world around us is going to be shaped by how these machines see or understand or calculate meaning. And so it makes a lot of sense that artists would intervene at that point of gathering new data sets of things that aren't you know, commercial, commercially relevant or they're, you know, um, for political reasons, they're not being seen. And there's, you know, there's plenty, plenty of fodder there. There are artists and, and you know, theorists who would advocate for the invisibility of certain things, that um, the visibility of them or the, you know, the making them into data sets is a form of violence. And the, those who advocate for making thing, certain things visible for whatever political reason. But I think, yeah, he just sort of, it, for me, it really opened my eyes to this idea, like, of course, artists would be working with data sets at this point. It's like the new vision on the world, you know? Mm, okay. Um, moving on then, has your, again, another one for the, for the creatives, has your per perception of creativity and creative practice um, changed um, as a consequence of using AIs? I guess, Ernest, if you kick off this one, because, you know, you've been using this stuff for, for uh, forever. <laughs> yeah. how, is, how has your creative practice changed over the years? Well, that's difficult because um, I started getting involved in AI um, as I started using computers in my art, which is at the end of the 60s. So that was a long, long time ago. Um, so I'm just trying to remember what my art was like before that. Well, I can remember. Um, first of all, it was not interactive. So the big thing, and in fact, that paper that I put up uh, an image of at the beginning in 1970 was sort of saying this was this was before PCs, you know, when computers were filling rooms and whatever. Um, but we thought the future was interaction and that, that the ear really, and the, to, to emphasize this point that's been made several times already that we should think of these technologies as, as the new media. So, so if you think of AI as a new medium for art, what was it gonna offer? It was gonna offer interactive art and interactive art was very new to us. It was the time of happenings and whatnot, but I wasn't making it. So what did it do for me? Well, what we were into in those days, it was called systems art. We were making art with mathematical and structural things underneath them and producing series. So you had like 24 drawings, for example, all of which were quite similar, where some parameter had been changed so that each one was a little bit different and whatever. Um, and now we can look at that as reaching out towards something that somehow or another all this stuff enabled. But what was it that enabled it? Well, and now I speak personally, not for everyone, because this is only one line, but for personally, it was code. Okay, we could write code. And we, I, I in fact, in, in the early days, I used to write my software for my artworks in Prolog, which is a computer language that implemented logic and was invented for AI by, by AI people. Other people that I know used Lisp, which is another language which was used very heavily in the 
uh, AI community. So the AI languages became important. And why were they important? They were important because they enabled us to look at the underlying structures, uh, the intentions that we had for our art and so on, uh, and to animate them. And the great thing was I could do something instead of working for a week uh, and then the next week and then a week after on a drawing, trying to use all these systems and whatever, and then find it wasn't quite right. And then thinking, have I got the energy to start again? I could write some code and do it. And in an hour or two later, see it. And I'd go through several iterations in a day. Uh, and I could, in fact, and I started in what I first started making time-based work, which were AI pieces, actually, I won't explain why, because we don't have time, but they were AI pieces, time-based pieces. Uh, and I made works that would have taken me literally a year to make previously using the AI software. And I could make a new work in an hour or two. And now that tra completely transformed my process. Go back to this word that several of us agree with, that it's all about the process. The creative process was completely transformed formed by that. And I think AI is transforming the creative process in this way. Okay. Uh, and that's mostly what it's done for me. Briefly. So, Cecily, did you want to jump in on that one as well? So, if you've got a view on this? Or are you so, I think, so I think working uh, with machine learning uh, has uh, maybe changed my creative process in, in two ways. Uh, so basically, I've always created new media art. Uh, so, so I've always been entangled with technology. But I think what machine learning, at least for me, has introduced is, first of all, as I have stated a lot in this, the, the collaborative process with the data scientists and the software engineers. So it's really a collaborative. That's the one thing. And then the other thing is this thing about how, in a way, you know, when you work with machine learning and you, you're coding, of course you can, as uh, Ernest points to watch, you can do something way more fast than the human brain would, would be able to. But there's also the other thing, which is the slow process. You know, you set out and you have some kind of idea and then you code and code and code and code and code and code and code for weeks and weeks and weeks before you in a way can, can just to do a small experiment, you have to do a lot of coding and then something happens and sometimes it's amazing, sometimes it's totally a fuck up, right? And then in a way you maybe have to start coding for, for four weeks again before you in a way can see the result of your experiment. So another time you can do really fast codings and you can have an experiment emerging quickly. But the thing that is something about in a way when you do complex machine learning artworks, that can also be kind of like a long time frame before you can actually see a, a result of, of an experimental process. Um, so, so that's in a way the when you work with, with the with the algorithms, the, the the quickness and the slowness is is different from when you work with, with humans or when you work with video or VR or something. I think I think it's yeah, there's there's different the, the slowness is different places and the fastness is, is other places than with, when you work with other technologies because of course it's a different media and the process is different. Sure, and and this idea about um, code uh, is, is, it's come through on another question. So, do you think it's necessary as an artist to write your own code, uh, or um, you know, can you get away with using um, resources such as uh, Deep Dream, say, to to uh, you know, to um, help you kick off a creative process. And I guess that, well, let's think about that from two different perspectives, one from the, the creative process and the other from the commissioning process. Um, so if we, if we get onto a sort of a gallery perspective of that as well. So what do you think? Who wants to start that one? I, I can start. So I think, as you can tell, from my, in my practice, it's extremely important to do the coding on our own. But of course, you never do like the coding in a vacuum. It's always based upon the GitHub repositories and research papers from Stanford or Berkeley or MIT or something. So in my practice, that's crucial. But I still think you can have an extremely interesting practice where you use kind of like pre-made machine learning frameworks. So uh, GANs or, or whatever, Deep Dream or other artistic platform where, where, where these kind of like GANs or NLP uh, algorithms are kind of like implemented into an interface where you just plug it in. But 
I think it's extremely important if that is your artistic practice. It's not enough just to kind of like do something with where you plug it in and something comes out. In a way, you need to have an artistic practice that is about investigating that that algorithm that you're interacting with. Or you need to kind of be, like have a different practice where the re reflexive space happens and 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 is related to what what you're doing with this algorithm or how this algorithm influences you or the surroundings or whatever. It's not because as it's more kind of like a tool, you put something in and you get something out. You know, it's not enough just to put an image in and get a, a deep dream image out. You need to somehow have have a question you want to ask with this, or you need to do something else with it or put it in a different context or something, from my perspective. So from my point of view, I'd say um, that, well, I'll indicate in a moment that no, it isn't necessary, but it's very, very important very often for the artist to code or at least know perfectly well how to do the code. And that's because if the code, if the algorithms are, is, are part of the medium that is being explored, then they need to understand the medium. If you're painting with oil paint, you need to understand it's oil and it's different to tempera and acrylic. And, you know, uh, the artist needs to understand the differences and so on. And it's exactly the same with code. So if the code matters, in other words, if the algorithm matters, then yes, the artist has to be able to code. They may have a system. I mean, Leonardo didn't put every bit of tempera on the walls that he of his works because of the big works, the editors, assistants did bits of them, but he could have done the whole thing if he'd had enough time. Uh, however, my, my other point would be that as we've indicated before, quite a lot of the work in our area is now collaborative. So that art making can be rather more like filmmaking. So you have a team of people doing it. And it's not always the case in a film that everyone can do everything. They collaborate together. And it can be the same in making complex artworks. So I would say that I can't see why an artist can't be part of a team uh, where the code is written by someone else and the code is something that the artist doesn't understand but in that case the code writer is part of the creative team so probably their name is on the work as well really good point actually um melanie what's your take on this from from a maybe a curatorial point of view yeah certainly so from an institutional point of view i would concur actually with both what cecily and um, anist have already said before like traditionally um at the v &A, we've always the majority of works in the collection, um, coded works, the artists themselves have coded, but that's not to say that we wouldn't consider works where it's um, there's been a collaboration or, um, uh, yeah, they've used um, like pre-existing packages. I just think, as already been stated really eloquently, that there needs to be an understanding, um, a deep understanding of the code by the artist um, for it to be valid um, and of interest in the first place for an institution to want to collect it or display it. Okay. Um, Eva? Um, yeah, the way that we work at the arts technologies team is that we build teams uh, in-house. So we're always very embedded within the production team and have a role to play within that, whether it's technical or administrative. Um, and I think that's very essential um, to an understanding of the work. And it's what sort of like led to the Creative AI Lab and other labs, uh, uh, like m more of an interest in spending time in those spaces and not letting all of that knowledge just fall away after an exhibition. Um, the other thing, that, I'm sorry, my dog's barking. <laughs> um, the other thing that I would say is um, there are lots of ways of understanding uh, the logic of code. David Benke wrote a great, or just finished a PhD all about sort of the value of diagramming within understanding coded language. And I think, you know, if code isn't the way, you know, if you don't want to write or read code, but you're interested in the logic systems and you are able to diagram, you know, in influence within those apparatuses, yeah, I think that's just as valid. Okay, okay. Um, thinking then about the, the, the role of the, the curator, the commissioner and what have you, 
Um, this is a question that came up in one of our other uh, talks and um, see what you make of this. What happens to art when art is made by engineers or scientists who don't have art training? Does art become design? Does the label art even matter in creative technology? How does that influence how you showcase and commission creative AI artwork? Maybe I'll jump in with this one. Um, although not specifically entirely about AI, I did obviously touch on it, I'd probably um, refer back to cybernetic serendipity, um, a, a, like early exhibition where um, artists' work was shown side by side with scientists and it wasn't distinguished who made what. So I think um, that this isn't something new. Um, and I don't think that it especially matters, but then I've probably got quite a biased perspective as working for the VNA, which is a National Museum of Art and Design. And we don't make that big distinction, whether it's art, whether it's designed. Um, the 2018 display, Artificially Intelligent, which Cecil was um, a part of, um, I acquired artwork from that show as a curator of digital art, whereas my colleague, Natalie Kane, who's the curator of digital design, also acquired artwork from that show, but acquired it as design. At the end of the day, both pieces are in the museum's collection. Um, and so I don't tend to make too much of a distinction, but that probably reflects the institutional collecting of the Victor and Albert Museum. So I'd be interested to hear Eva's thoughts on this. Um, I don't know. I It's probably gonna be very unpopular, but I just don't, I don't think that those distinctions matter beyond, you know, certain forms of gatekeeping and value creation. Fair enough. Ernest, what's your take on this one? Um, yeah, I don't, I agree with Eva really. I don't think about it. If I remember correctly, Van Gogh did eventually do a course on drawing, but he didn't do very well. <laughs> so I'm not sure the training is really like a big issue. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Cecily, do you want to jump in on this as well? You're muted. I think what I wanted to say has been said, so it's fine. Fair enough, okay. Um, okay, so let's, let's uh, move on to another panel question, uh, sorry, another um, uh, YouTube question here. Um, how does the panel go about finding collaborators to work with, picking up on your team-based? comments. Um, comment here is, this, this is from Zoom, Zumba Pup, whoever that is. Um, I'm an engineer, but would love to work with artists on machine learning artworks. How do you, how do you go about collaborating? What's your view? Anyone? Uh, well, I guess I can go on this one. So um, I think it also depends where you are and where in your, in your artistic practice and your career. So to begin with, I had like these more loosely coupled uh, collaborations with um, software engineers and we would do like from project to project. Uh, but as I started getting uh, larger uh, commissions, I, uh, I started seeing the value of having people that you work with on a daily basis. So that's why right now I have uh, three full times uh, software developers working with me. So, um, and I found that, you know, I'm extremely network based. So, you know, it's it's about being round and about and talking to people because one, you know, when you wanna, as an artist, when you wanna find people that you can work with who are data scientists and software engineers, there's of course two things that need to work out. One is that they have to be extremely good at coding and really good in their field. And another thing is that you need to have like a great energy together and you need to be in a way able to, to, to uh, you know, question and ask questions to the world and the artistic practice in, 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 in an open-ended way uh, together. So of course, there's also a lot of like a, a personal match. So I think that's important. Uh, but in a way, I think it's always about being out there, meeting people. Of course, you can also meet, meet people online in a lot of online communities and you know, try to do some projects uh, and then as you go along, you'll meet people where you see like, okay, let's do another project uh, together. Uh, and then I also want to stress that right now I'm also working quite a lot with the researchers at the, the university. And I think that's also a really nice way of collaborating. But of course, that's a little more loosely coupled than the, the software developers I work with on a daily basis. But still, this research community is extremely great because it's, yeah, it, the way of questioning in, in research resonates really well with the way I, in a way, ask questions in my artistic practice. 
So, so for me, that's kind of like, yeah, the way it has unfolded. And sometimes I also have a project where I invite, you know, maybe we need a specific uh, software development skill. And then there's somebody who's involved in a project only for a couple of months, for example. Mm-hmm. Or for a hack, you know, we make a hackathon where we created an artwork in a weekend. And then a lot of people are involved. So, um, yeah. So I think it's always about meeting people real life online and figuring out who, because at the end of the day, art is about, you know, having something you want to put into the world, asking some questions that people can relate to. And then you need to meet other people who in a way have the same sense of what are the urgent questions we should ask through our practice. So in that sense, you need to, of course, yeah, interact with people to figure out who, who is in a way on the same path as you are. That's quite a challenge, isn't it? Um, identifying the networks of people that you can collaborate with. Ernest, how do you go about doing that? Well, I mean, I think that uh, an interesting anecdote is quite a big anecdote, really. Uh, many years ago, when uh, we had a research project, funded research project to have artists in residence uh, working collaborative, collaboratively, in, it was in Loughborough University in Leicestershire. Um, the interesting thing was, that an artist would come in and we'd identify some technical support that would be helpful. And we would go across the university to unknown departments. We didn't have a bunch of people ready to help. We just went searching. Um, We never got a rejection, right? People were always interested uh, in being involved in creative work uh, using their technical skills. So that way around, it was very, very easy. And I would say that the university environment was a wonderful one for that purpose. So it provided a network, really just ready-made network, and also a lot of resources that could be employed uh, in spare time to do it and so on. Um, from the other way around, let's to say, if technical people uh, wanting to get involved with Uh, with artists, then I think it's a question of finding such communities. So, okay, the art department of a university may be a a place, but there are plenty of organisations now that you can find online uh, where artists are getting together using technology of one kind or another. I'm almost certain that every one of them will be very pleased to have a technically skilled person come along and saying, hey, does anyone want me to work with them? You know, so I'm, I'm only repeating, in a, in a sense, what, what uh, we've, we've just heard. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think the roles are of the, um, the galleries and the museums in facilitating network networking? Um, Melanie and um, Eva, do you want to, who wants to kick it on that one? Yeah, I think, it's, um, I think it's huge. We often work with artists who are exploring something for the first time and like nurturing relationships and being kind of emotional support to all parties involved is a huge part of that and creating those bridges between communities and often people go on to work together um, and we lose we lose good engineers all the time um, to, to studio practices. But uh, I, I agree with um, what Ernest said about um, getting maybe reaching out to um, certain school departments, because I think you also have to figure out what you're personally interested in. You don't want to become a service. Well, you might not want to become a service provider to an artist, but instead, you know, have an exploration that you want to share with, um, with an artist um, or with a group of artists and engineers. Um, And so I think, yeah, just considering, you know, the relationship and not, you know, that no party becomes exploited and that everyone sort of has a stake in it, that's when the best relationships and the best projects come out of those relationships. Mm. And and there's there's clearly a a, a more balanced relationship with when you're talking about um, AIs and, and, and creative practice, if you see them as two different skill sets, I guess. Melanie, do you want to pick up on this one as well? Uh, Yeah, certainly. So I kind of, in practical terms, this is actually much more an essential or not essential, like a pivotal part of my role when I worked in the learning department where I was a digital programs manager, more so than my other dual role that I had at the same time, which was a curation of perhaps more traditional 
sense as a keeper of collections. But then having said that, I would work informally and um, create networking events and, um, mm. you know, bring people together or share contacts and networks. Um, um, and I think that's where um, these different synergies between different people um, were fostered and developed. And um, yeah, some very interesting things took place through those initial introductions. But um, yeah, I think it definitely was much, from a VNA perspective, I hope this changes, but it was seen much more as um, creating those dialogues was seen much more, was more viable when I was in a, in a learning role and was able to like program different events for people, like different meetups and as such. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's not really, or I haven't really seen any um, viable formalized networking structures emerge in this field. Not, not, not really. I, I think Luba did a, a little bit of work with a, a creative AI meetup, but I'm, I'm not sure that that's still running. Um, maybe. Is, is I it guess I, I would just add to that that although I think it's important for institutions to play a role, I don't think it should totally fall solely on them. Mm. I think there's so many other avenues and platforms and way for people to meet. Um, so yes, institutions have a part to play, but I think it's really important that we look a bit broader and think about where these different collaborations can take place. Indeed, indeed. Um, all right, well, another question here then. What's, what is the future of, the, of, a, of creative AI as a gallery experience? I mean, bearing in mind, um, you know, I'm running a festival here where we're, where we're deliberately not putting uh, creative art, AI artwork in a gallery. We are, we are some of it, but not all of it. Most of it is in the public realm. So what do you think the future of, of it is in, in, as a gallery experience? Who wants to? Eva, Melanie? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't read the future, but I guess what, we, what I'm working on, what I'm interested in is I think we've had a great, a great and important work of these sort of survey shows. And I think there was a massive sort of education of the public. And now I think we're ready to very much dive into um, projects where there is very sophisticated technology being used and it, it can be described and experienced in a non-didactic way where it really opens up a lot of questions. And um, I think a lot of the groundwork has been laid with these sort of major exhibitions in the last five years, 10 years. Um, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see um, as things have slowed down during, co you know, post COVID, I hope, you know, these exhibitions can be given more time to develop um, and be shown over longer periods of time and maybe, you know, be in states of flux um, as, as viewers come to the exhibitions. Melanie, do you want to pick up on that as well? Uh, yes, I guess this is like maybe a good time to mention the AI and U exhibition that's currently happening um, in Athens from the Anastas Foundation, which is also happening in the public sphere, but that's very much due to um, the pandemic. Originally, it was planned to be inside, um, created by Irini Papadimitri, but is now in the public sphere. Um, what do I think about it into the future for gallery experiences? I just think it very much depends on the artist and the artworks being shown. I think um, there's still going to be a space for that, um, if I think about um, like the Lemme Your Face um, exhibition that was at the photography, the AI show that was at the photography's gallery until recently, it was um, in the gallery. Then also people were able to view it on their mobile phones and have the um, uh, kind of Lemme Your Face, um, go fake yourself um, aspect of this. And I just think, yeah, there's, there's, there's space for both. I think we'll see more of it, but I also think we'll see um, different ways of engaging um, with AI create, AI artists and their creativity, not solely just in the gallery experience. Mm. Maybe how we think about galleries and will broaden as well. I think we've got quite a narrow view about what a gallery space is, but I think that definition will change as well. That's interesting. Say a bit more about that, can you? Um, well, I just think at the moment is is we still think in terms of, well, some of us still think in terms of it being very static, but like what the curator of the 21st century, which is something that kind of myself and my colleagues have been thinking about quite a lot at the moment, what role they have to play and 
um, the need to be more flexible and how we work and where we work will change. And I think with that, changing practices um, will, I mean, the institutions and those galleries will still exist. I just think that how people engage with art curated by um, maybe institutional curators will um, be more flexible. I think when people encounter it in different ways, it's really hard to specify exactly how the point is it will be different to what we know currently. And that's probably as far as I can predict the future, but yeah, it's different, different, different ways of doing different things. Ernest, did you want to pick up on that one as well? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, there has been a trend sort of out of the gallery, not against the gallery, but art being out of the gallery for a long time. Never mind about AI or computers, it's a general trend. But I think in the context of what we're discussing in this panel, <clears throat> I think in particular, a trend in interactive art has been towards what is sometimes called ambient interaction. <clears throat> so away from interactive artworks where you have to go up to it, put on a headset or, I don't know, do something very specific. Um, uh, art where the interaction happens because you walk past it um, and, or speak or something, where people are not even aware that there is an artwork there, but become, the artwork makes itself uh, noticed somehow mm -hmm. by interacting. And these things happen in the street. So this is one path in which some interactive art has been moving quite heavily in recent times. And, uh, and I do some of this myself. And that kind of work uh, is, is a growing area which will take place in the street, in shopping malls, in bars and restaurants and everywhere, right? And also, most importantly, connecting those places together because we have the internet, we can e easily have distributed artworks which exist in many places, connecting these places together. So connecting the back streets and the little funny places with the, with the high street, for example. So you have a sort of architectural thing going on. And all of that is out of the gallery and is a new kind of area, which some art, not all art by a long way, but some art is definitely pursuing. Mm. Cecily, do you want to pick up on that as well? So, uh, yeah, I, th I believe that I think in the future we will see more artworks that's also kind of like can can take on different forms. So uh, they can emerge in a specific way in a museum or gallery setting, and then they uh, uh, look totally different online. And then maybe you are there is an artistic process within itself is also the artwork where people are you know, scoring or gathering or somehow creating the data set. So, so I think in a way you can maybe have different ends or doors that you come into the artwork through, which will be different depending on which media you're, if you're online or physical, or if you're part of the, in a way, the creative process in like workshop and things like that. So, so I think in, in that sense, you will have artworks that's of course interactive by nature and machine learning based by nature and which will, you know, yeah, you will not say, okay, this is how the artwork looks, or this is the experience this artwork gives, because the artwork will emerge and re-emerge depending on the people it's interacting with in a specific context, and depending on also where what process we are in. Are we in the kind of like data collection part of the artwork, or are we in the scoring part of the artwork, or are we somehow interacting with it to to uh, to enable the machine learning algorithm to to learn in a different way or something like that. Well, um, <laughs> you know, we've got loads more questions um, coming in, some really interesting ones, but sadly we're running out of time. Um, we've got just two minutes left. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more quick question um, uh, and an um, answer from from a couple of you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, do you think AI has the potential to change the relationship between art and audiences? Just a short answer. Who wants to kick off? I'd say yes, that's my short answer. <laughs> that's your short answer. <laughs> Ernest? Uh, yes, slightly longer answer. That's what we've been trying to do since the 60s and AI makes it a lot easier to do it. Thank you. Eva? Absolutely, definitely. <laughs> okay, Cecily? Definitely, yeah. Okay, that's great. 
Okay, well, thank you so much to um, the, the panel for um, taking the time to um, speak to us uh, this evening. Uh, we had a, a, a really great range of, of questions. Thanks to um, the audience on the YouTube stream and to Luba and Chris for um, managing that process. And also um, thanks to Sean and to um, Nick for collaborating with us um, uh, for the, uh, with, the, with the EVA conference. Um, we've got uh, a lot of things going on at the moment on the, at the, uh, um, for the Art AI Festival, which you can find out about on our, um, on our website. Um, and we've also got um, more online uh, events taking place, um, but now not until September. So we're gonna have a bit of a summer recess where we're gonna focus on the actual artworks in Leicester. So if you're in the city, do come in uh, and have a look at some of the, of the artworks, which are actually happening out on the street. So we've got things like Hello Lamppost, which is a thing behind me, which is um, talking about some of the artworks. We've got Masked Reality uh, by Harshit Agrawal, which is running in Haymarket Shopping Centre at the moment. And next week we'll also be running Hetzel's, which is Alex Mulvincess' work uh, in Green Dragon Square, uh, and some other artworks coming up um, later in the year. Bo ben Bogart's work will be running at Phoenix uh, in September. Um, and Ben will also be talking to us uh, in September as well. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. And we'll look forward to seeing you after the summer break. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a very good, lovely time. <laughs>